Hello and welcome to chapter six. Now, chapter six for the seventh edition of the NASM CPT manual basically is the moving forward of the systems approach because in chapter five we worked on um, basically the interaction between muscles muscle system, the skeletal system, and the nervous system. And here we're just going to get into the separate components of the cardiorespiratory, endocrine, and the digestive systems. All right, and we're going to break down each of those into their own structures and basically how each system kind of works handily throughout, you know, the whole body and how it makes and affects our movement. All right, so this is chapter six. So let's get started here and we'll work our way through. So when we start, the main, the one of the main systems of our body because it includes multiple components, but it's very important for you know anything from sending things off and pulling things out to just being able to function like the heart and breathing. Okay, so the cardiorespiratory system really, you know, we have to make sure that we get both pieces of that. Cardiovascular is heart, blood vessels, blood. Cardiorespiratory is heart, blood vessels blood, lungs, and then through the whole airway system, all right? So it is the interaction between the cardiovascular and respiratory system. So that's just kind of how the interaction between two systems is really made into one. But what's the main function here? We want to make sure that we get appropriate, adequate, the right amount, max level, low level, depending upon rest or work, um, O2 delivery, okay? We also want to be able to deliver nutrients, and we also want to be able to take when we break those nutrients and down for our energy purposes, we want to be able to get the waste byproducts such as CO2, ammonia, et cetera, out of our system. And we do that by way of this complete system. Okay. So, you know, again, all about transportation. Okay. It's about getting things to move through the body. And by those things, I mean the blood. Okay. Well, where does the blood really originate from? Blood originates from, you know, originates from the heart, but that heart is very tricky because it has the right and left sides, but those right and left sides are very important because right side, it doesn't have any oxygen, left side does. So the right side has to pump blood to the lungs and the lungs will send that back to the heart. And then the left side will basically take that blood that has oxygen in it now and it will send that to the rest of the body so that it can be used and extracted and you know for for whatever purpose that it needs it for okay so you know again the heart is it's got an oblique shaped you know positioning it's not vertical it's not you know horizontal it's actually got like a little bit of a twist to it all right um but really it's in it's obviously in front of the spine and it sits behind your sternum, okay? And it's located within that thoracic cavity. Um, so what do, we, what do we call that area? We call the, the space within the chest that's between the lungs, the, the mediastinum, all right? And that basically sits right in that same area as the lungs as well. So the heart, very much like skeletal muscle, the heart contains cardiac muscle. There is the same kind of push um, pulling mechanism that the cardiac muscle has, um, but unlike skeletal muscle, um, in some way, you know, some skeletal muscle can do it on its own, but typically skeletal muscle is voluntary where we call upon it. The heart is involuntary for that purpose. Okay. So I kind of hit on the left and right sides already, but we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. Okay. So the first things first, there are four hollow chambers. All right. And if we go back, well, the same, it's the same picture, but you know, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, and they are going to be working independently, right and left sides. Like I said, the right side is more about getting blood to the lungs. The left side is more about getting the blood to the rest of the body. Now, upper, upper is the A's. Okay, the A's. Now, the, the upper chambers, the superior chambers are what we call the atrium. The inferior chambers are the ventricles. The ventricles are what fill and release, fill and release. That, again, right side goes to the lungs, left side goes to the rest of the body, basically through the aorta. Um, 
So again, what's the atria's job is to gather blood to get all of that blood volume back into the heart so then it can pop it down to the ventricles and then send it to where it's got to go, okay? So really important just to kind of make sure we understand this. It's one of the few places that it happens. We know about, we should at this point, well, maybe not this point, but we will know soon that arteries send blood away from the heart and veins take blood back to the heart. So it's a little tricky because usually in almost all cases, except for what we're going to talk about now, in almost all cases, arteries always have oxygenated blood, not for the heart. All right. And veins always, except for this time, they usually carry deoxygenated blood. But in the heart, when blood pumps out of the right atrium and sends the blood to the lungs to get oxygen basically put into it all right, and extracted out of the alveoli, when that happens, the blood has to be sent away from the heart. So again, A is away, A for artery. Arter the pulmonary artery is the only artery in the system that carries deoxygenated blood. And as that pulmonary artery left and right branch gets sending blood to the lungs, the, once the lungs pull, you know, once all the O2 is extracted from the lungs, into the blood, the blood through capillaries and back through will get sent to the pulmonary vein. Again, we're the only vein in the body that carries oxygenated blood. Okay. And then that goes back to the left atrium and then ready to get out to, you know, to the left ventricle out to the rest of the body. So those are kind of some major components that we want to understand and, and really kind of pull through so that, you know, you understand, you know, the, the structure base. Okay. I kind of just through my words, I said all of these details right here. So all you want to, if you need to go back and listen to that and kind of pull this up at the same time, feel free. But just again, you know, the right atrium gets blood. So right atrium right in here. Okay. The right atrium gets blood from the rest of the body. All right. Now that's deoxygenated. So that comes into the rest of the body. The right atrium releases blood through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle down in the lower left, this lower left region. But again, we're looking at this from an anterior view. So it's backwards. So this is the right side if it's in our, if it's in our own body. Okay. So right ventricle, if you follow the direction up, okay, it'll get into the left pulmonary and right pulmonary arteries because you're going to go to the right and left, you know, branches of the heart. So then that blood gets, comes back through the pulmonary veins, as you can see over here on the right, into the left atrium, down through the left ventricle. And then if you look at it, it kind of goes upward into the aorta and it spills out it's superiorly through the aorta. You know, and then if you look up top here, this is what we would call the aortic arch. And then the aorta branches off into different, you know, smaller arteries, you know, and then you end up with the descending aorta that comes down through the back side of the heart. So that's how the, the, the pathway would be for that. So, you know, that's great and all. We know the directionality, but what we don't, what we have to understand is that cardiac muscle really has to have um, a contraction, just like skeletal muscle has to have a contraction for it to work. So we have our own, you know, our, our body has its own, um, you know, conduction system within it. Okay. So if you look at it, you know, our resting heart rate, you know, NASM basically explains, and this is probably going to be a test question on, the, on your physical CPT test, but your test question is looking more so at about 60 to 100 beats per minute for most people. Now, most people, most average people, people who exercise typically have the lower end of the heart rates, um, people who are, you know, that are hypertensive. Um, well, not hypertensive, people who are obese or well, hypertensive could be part of that. But if you're obese, sedentary, you don't do a lot of things, you, you know, you want to, you, you're probably going to realize that your heart rate is going to be more elevated because you are not using it correctly. So it's not as effective and efficient. Okay. So again, with our resting heart rate, we know we could take our pulse for that. And we'll talk about that in a little while, but you know, that's one of those assessments that we we can are going to talk about actually i believe that is in chapter 11 when we talk about how to take your your pulse but um you know for now understand that that's how we would do it 60 second count how many times the heart beats during that 60 seconds 
Now, within our heart, we do have nerves. We have bundles of nerves that fly through the in, inner workings of our muscle, uh, of the cardiac muscle, of the actual heart itself. And they are the ones that produce the lub dub. Now, the lub dub is the lub is the first contraction of the right side pump. The, the dub is the left side pump. Now, how are those innervated? How are those? How does that have a reaction to it nervous system wise? So you have what's called the SA node. The SA node is our true pacemaker. It's called the sinoatrial nerve uh, node. And its job is to contract the right atrium. All right. So that it can start its, you know, the path of the blood to come through. Okay. So, you know, it, it's located in the right atrium, but its job is to make sure that it, it gets the atrium you know, both atria and down into the ventricles so that we have blood that shoves down, you know, into those ventricles so they're ready to go. Okay. Um, the AV or atrioventricular node is the secondary node that is, has an interconnection between the SA and the, you know, and the AV it has a, a connection point to it. Now it's located between the atria and the ventricles, like almost right in the center piece to that. And what it does is it, it basically slows down the impulse, not slows it down, but it takes it as a secondary impulse. And what it does is once you get the SA node to fire, atria spill blood into the ventricles. And then from that point on, what ends up happening is that AV node will now, you know, will send out the signals through what we call, you know, bundle branches into what we would then call Purkinje fibers, which are the little fibers that you see on the very, very bottom here. And that will fire off the ventricles, so then that blood will get sent to either the lungs or the rest of the body. And that's how the contraction part will work with the, with the help of the SA and the AV node. So when we have blood that goes out to the body, we have to think about a few terms. Number one, we talked about heart rate. We, talk, we just talked about resting heart rate. But heart rate is the number of times that your body, uh, your, your heart beats per minute. Now, with exercise, you know, it can, it'll elevate with rest. It should lower. Now, anything below 60, we would call it bradycardia. Anything above a hundred is called tachycardia. So even though those are kind of, you know, negative connotation kinds of words, understand that in one minute, if you're, if you're resting heart rate, or if your heart rate is below 60, it does not mean it's severe unless there's obviously an underlying condition that's going on. Same thing holds true with hundred beats per minute. If you go over that with tachycardia, you know, you're looking at it from the standpoint that if you go into exercise, you will go into tachycardia, but again, your heart and your body can withstand that, All right? So your heart rate is really important. The second piece to that, and I know I'm kind of going out of order here, but it'll make a little bit more sense. The heart rate comes, you know, is, is how many times your heart beats per minute. Stroke volume is for every time that your heart beats, the amount of blood that is pumped out in that one beat with each contraction is the amount of what we would say is the stroke volume, okay? So we have two components here. We have end diastolic and end systolic volumes. So end diastolic volume is when your heart rate, when, you, when your heart, not heart rate, when your heart relaxes after it has sent out blood to the, the body or the lungs, all right, it's that relaxation point. It's the refilling of the ventricles after it contracts. And then end systolic volume is the amount of blood that is remaining after the ventricles have let out all the blood that it needed to let out, okay? So those are two terms that come along with it, but understand that stroke volume, whatever the amount of blood is that goes out of the, of the left ventricle predominantly into the aorta would be what you would consider to be your stroke volume. Anything left over is your end systolic volume and the amount of blood that fills back into the ventricle is considered your diastolic volume and diastolic volume. So what we have here is now a stroke volume, blood pump per beat, heart rate, the amount of times your heart beats per minute, multiply those two together and you get what's called cardiac output. Now cardiac output for this case is on the bottom there. It is actually heart rate times stroke volume. All right. So if you have a 60 beat per minute cardiac output, and you have 100 milliliters of blood that goes out, it would be 60 times 100, which is 6,000 milliliters of blood per minute. So about six liters of blood, okay? 
Um, typically at one time, our heart usually holds about four to six liters anyway, so that's pretty close. But just understand that, you know, for, for just for multiplication's sake, that's what we're looking at is stroke volume times heart rate gives you cardiac output or the amount of blood that is pumped out of your body in milliliters or liters per minute, okay? So, okay, so it was, it was not in a different chapter, but manual monitoring of your heart rate. Um, NASM is, they, they recommend that you um, take, you know, they recommend that you don't take and it says it in number one, they do not recommend that you take your, your blood pressure, your heart rate at the carotid artery, which would be in your neck. They prefer if you were to take your fingers and place them on the, radi the radial artery so that you can get a pulse down in that region. Um, the other thing they say is that it, the reason why is because it says here, Pressure on this artery reduces blood flow to the brain, which can cause dizziness or an inaccurate measurement. So if you're pressing on that carotid artery, you're compressing that artery. You're making it very, you're making it more challenging for that blood to get through there. So that can cause a disruption in the system. So therefore you could tap out. Okay. So just understand that's the main reason why they would prefer you to take it down at the radial artery, you know, on that thumb side. Okay. Um, so again, with blood, we're really looking at it from the standpoint that it needs to travel throughout the body in the best way it can with the minimal, with the least amount of constriction or resistance that would be there. And that usually revolves with blood pressure. All right. The heart has it in it. You know, arteries, capillaries, veins are all filled with blood. All right. And, you know, obviously organs can hold on to it well, as well, especially the, the liver, which is more about filtration and processing, and then the excretion, which, you know, again, we're filled, you know, with the kidneys. So, you know, what do we have inside the blood? Well, the liquidy part is called plasma, but we also have things like glucose, so sugar. We also have fat or lipids. We have proteins, hormones, uh, clotting agents, you know, coagulatory items. And then other, you know, other molecules like hormone, oh, we said hormones, but enzymes that might be out there, many other things. So that majority of the blood is made up of that liquidy component called plasma. Then you have other cells like red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets that are all in there. So of that total volume, we said majority is plasma, about 55%. And then the cells make up about 45%. Again, red blood cells, white blood cells, and the platelets, okay? We said it before, but the average adult can hold anywhere between, you know, typically about four to six liters of blood in their body at one point in time. Um, so, you know, again, you know, with blood, we want to be able to transport things. We want to transport oxygen and nutrients. We want to be able to get rid of waste products. We want to be able to, to move around hormones, growth factors, stem cells. And we also want to be able to use our blood as a way to remove heat to the periphery and actually be able to be, blood can help with temperature regulation of the body, okay? Also, it's for a protective component because, you know, if we start bleeding, you know, clotting will take into effect and then also protective because immune, the immune system will send white blood, you know, white blood cells and other immune cells to be able to fight off infections or disease or sickness or whatever it may be. So it's really important that blood is always on the go. All right, now the blood vessels we talked about, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Now, arteries have those branches that we have are arterioles, so smaller artery branches. All right, so the arteries will spill blood into arterioles if they need to. Those arterioles will eventually diminish themselves down to small, small, small microscopic blood vessels called capillaries. Those capillaries are where we would have what we would call diffusion. And diffusion is where we would allow for the exchange of waste and nutrients and oxygen and CO2, amongst other things that will get into them. And one cell at a time, kind of like a single file line um, that you would have in like a kindergarten classroom. And that's how those cells get into where or in or out or wherever they have to go. So once capillaries release things into the working muscles or organs or wherever they're working with, the waste byproducts will go back into the capillaries, which will then send that waste through the venules, which are smaller branches of veins, and eventually spill out into the veins and then back to the heart. And that's really the, the, the way that we travel the whole way through. And that's why you see the, the, the cycle there, because that's the way that it would always carry through. 
Okay, but remember the one major thing to think about is the exchange part is always the capillaries. You're not going to have the exchange of the veins or the arteries. So, you know, we talked about heart rate, we talked about stroke volume, we talked about cardiac output. All right, so that's more about beating. Now we're talking about pressure that's put on the heart or put out through the heart. Now, normally we would think, you know, you got to be very careful because there is there is interaction, but it, you know, just because your heart rate increases doesn't mean blood pressure increases. Just because blood pressure increases doesn't mean heart rate does. So they don't always work hand in hand. But understand blood pressure has two components, a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure. Now, systolic pressure is the pressure that's put on, um, is put out into the arteries when you have a contraction of the ventricle, of the, particularly the left ventricle. So at the, when the left ventricle ejects blood, it's the amount of pressure that is exerted on the aorta at that moment, okay? Then diastolic pressure is when you have the relaxation of the heart and the heart starts to fill back up with blood, and that is the diastolic pressure, okay? Higher number systolic, lower number diastolic. Typically, lower than 120 and lower than 80. That's what we want to see for our average people. You know, and then from there you have your elevated numbers, your stage one and twos. And then if there is a, what we would call a hypertensive crisis, or, you know, that would usually be like, okay, we got to go, you know, we got to take this person to the, ho the hospital because it can be a concern. But this we want to think about is under, you know, normal conditions. This is like, if you're um, taking your blood pressure after you did like a really heavy, like one rep max, well, then you know that your the, the blood pressure in your heart is going to be so elevated that it would seem like it would be a crisis because you stressed your body out, but that's not the case here. Okay. These are under normal working conditions or what we would say, you know, even under rest. Okay. So, you know, moving from the heart, you know, the, you know, more of the cardiovascular system, we're going to get into the respiratory system. So now we're talking about the lungs and the airway and the muscles that interact with that, particularly the diaphragm. Okay. And what's its job? It's to bring, uh, you know, the respiratory system's main job is to bring air in and that air is really hopefully enriched with a lot, a lot, a lot of oxygen. And then once everything is working and moving, we want to be able to expel or remove cardio, uh, carbon dioxide out of the lungs and into the environment where that will then get, you know, through photosynthesis and through other processes in the environment, that CO2 will then just be, you know, re, you know can be converted into O2 again. So, you know, with our breathing, we want to think about, you know, inspiration, expiration, inhalation, exhalation, Okay. So our body, you know, again, air moving in, moving out is, you know, we have what's called the respiratory pump, all right? So what we talk about are the structure of bones and the muscles that work together to bring, you know, really air in, pump blood back to the heart, you know, so that you can get O2 to where it's got to go, okay? So a major structures here, you're talking about, you know, for bone purposes, the sternum, the ribs, and the vertebrae. So again, if your vertebrae has some misalignment to it, it can really affect your breathing. If you've ever had a rib injury, you know that can affect your breathing, okay? For inspiration muscles, we're talking about the diaphragm, the external, inter the external intercostals, so those muscles that are on the external component of your ribs, your scalenes, which are on the sides of your neck, the sternocleidomastoid, which is on the front part of your neck, and then your pec minor or your pectoralis minor, which is the smaller chest muscles that sit below the pec major. Those muscles are really important to bring air in. To let air out for exhalation or expiration, we're talking about the internal intercostals, which sit below the external intercostals, and your, your abdomen, okay? So the interesting part of all of this is that you're like, oh, well, the diaphragm is really important with breathing. It is, but it really needs that diaphragm needs to contract for air to come in and it relaxes so you don't use the muscle per se when you breathe when you're breathing out. Okay? Cuz it's a, it's basically a recoil and a relaxation of that true muscle. All right? So, some things to think about with ventilation, inspiratory ventilation, Normal breathing requires the use of primary respiratory muscles, which we just talked about, the diaphragm and the external intercostals. 
Heavy breathing will take into account all the other ones that we had just talked about. So again, your scalene, sterno, clinomastoid, and your pec minor. So typically a normal person would be about 12 to 16 breaths per minute, okay? Um, you know, and that, that's pretty standard for a normal person. Now, expiratory ventilation here is, is, like I said, it's a passive process. It's a recoil, so it's the relaxative part of everything. And like it says here, heavier forced breathing will then, you know, basically require you to use expiratory muscles so that you can compress the cavity that holds the lungs, which is the thoracic cavity, to push air out, okay? So when we bring air in, we want to think about the ribs. They want to expand. The diaphragm contracts and moves downward. And when it does that, it opens up the, you know, the, the, basically the lungs to allow more air in, okay? And then pressure inside of the lungs is reduced. And then from there, when you blow out, the ribs and the diaphragm, they recoil like we talked about. The diaphragm moves up and the ribs kind of compress back down and that helps with, you know, and they compress back down via the internal intercostals. And that is where you would have that, basically that compression of the lungs to force air out. Also part of this breathing process is, and I know some of you have definitely done this before if you've worked out, is you've done what's called a Valsalva maneuver or basically when you stop, you know, where you basically stop your breathing, where you end up closing off your windpipe. And what that does, it, can, it basically creates a bracing around your abdominal region because what you're doing is, like it says there, you're increasing or creating more intra-abdominal pressure. And what that does, it'll stabilize the spine. So that's why when you're doing like a deadlift or a back squat or other motions that need spinal stabilization, um, clean and jerk, snatches, any sort of front squats, anything like that, you know, kettlebell swings, you're always trying to stabilize the core per se, but we want to talk about how we want to increase intra-abdominal pressure and creating like this belt around our waist via our muscles and our strong spine at that point. And so what that does is it allows us to be able to support heavy loads um, and basically it allows for, um, it, the only problem is that you get a lot of strain um, or compressive force that's put on the heart. So therefore what ends up happening is it's hard for uh, blood to get back to the heart. So that's why a lot of times if you don't breathe correctly, you get dizzy or lightheaded or might feel like you want to pass out or faint. So that's why it's always, it's really important to use this, you know, stopping of breathing in the right way, but we also want to make sure we relieve ourselves and breathe out accordingly when we need to. All right. So now it's like, okay, well, how do we get the air in? Well, we, you know, we want to get it into the lungs and we've talked about how to breathe, but which way does it go? So are you, you know, at that point in time, if we look at the, the airways, the talked about the conducting airways and the res respiratory airways, the conducting is where the air comes in. The respiratory airway is where you'd have the exchange part. So it would either start in either the nasal or oral cavity, so mouth or nose, move from the pharynx to the larynx to the trachea to your left or right or left bronchi, depending upon, you know, which lung, and then into the bronchioles or the smaller tree branches. And then at the ends of those bronchioles are your alveoli, where now you would have the diffusive part where you would have the diffusion, where you would let oxygen in to the capillaries from the alveoli. And at the same time, when the, the gradient changes and O2 goes out, that allows CO2 to come in and then the CO2 will be released through the mouth, you know, basically as water vapor. Okay. So that's the trajectory of everything that we're looking for there. And if we look, you know, again, this is more of just the image of it. So again, nasal, you know, nasal or, um, you know, oral cavities, depending upon which way it's coming through, through your pharynx, you know, down through your larynx. All right. And then from there, we would get into the trachea, which branches off into your bronchi, your right, and then your left. All right. Into your tree branches, your bronchioles. And again, at the end of those bronchioles, there are those sacs that are there that are basically enriched with O2, CO2 and are surrounded by capillaries to extract or to put in, to extract oxygen out of it and to re remove and put CO2 into the alveoli to then send them back in the reverse direction. 
So a really nice image here of everything going on. So, you know, again, you know, what's the main function here? We want to make sure that we're breathing correctly. We want to make sure that the blood is pumping correctly so that it can extract the oxygen at the alveolar level and then it gets everything to where it's got to go back to the heart and then to the rest of the body. Okay. We've talked about all of these components right here and all these bullet points. So no need to go back through them, but just understand this is all the vocabulary and a lot of the terminology that we have used to understand once O2 comes in, right? Blood that was pumped out is getting that blood pumped out of the heart to the lungs, gets all the oxygen in it, sends it back to the, the left atrium, to the left ventricle, then out to the rest of the body. Whereas CO2 goes back, you know, from the heart back to the lungs, and then just takes that reverse direction out from the alveoli back up and then out into the rest of the environment. So ultimately, when we talk about oxygen consumption or VO2, that's truly what oxygen consumption, oxygen uptake, that's part of what we, we always look for. And then when we assess people, we are trying to find their true VO2 max so we can train them correctly, okay? Um, so again, you know, just like Breda and tachycardia, you can have tachypnea uh, and bradypnea. And those are, again, slower or higher heart rates. You know, tachypnea is higher, bradypnea is lower, all right? And, we, and then dyspnea is basically shortness of breath. So you can have high, low, or shortness of, or labored breathing. So people who have like that irregular breathing, that's rapid and shallow, that's usually uncomfortable, okay? And then the other part that we always want to work on, and we kind of hit on this a little bit more about that bracing, is using our diaphragm to breathe. We don't want to really rely on our belly too much because that can really cause problems when it comes to, you know, posture and in the like, and getting air in, air out, and, and actually it can cause a problem when you're trying to brace, like we talked about, for doing any sort of resistance training. Okay. So that kind of cuts out our, our cardiorespiratory and let's move into the endocrine system. So we're talking basically about hormones, okay? And how the endocrine system will be able to, to have glands that release the hormones that will, those hormones will eventually will attach to a target receptor cell. And once it does that, it'll, it'll activate whatever is needed to be turned on for that particular time, okay? But you know, a lot of times these, you know, the endocrine system, it, you know, with those hormones, it can really change up a lot of things. And if you see down in the middle of the, of the, the bullets here, mood, growth and development, tissue function, metabolism, all of that it can, is controlled by hormones. But again, we need to make sure that hormones move through blood correctly. So again, if we're, if we're having issues with blood pressure, that can really change how we deliver our hormones to where they got to go. So there's our, our endocrine glands, the hypothalamus, you know, that's your, that's your, your brain communicator. Okay. Your pituitary gland, which a lot of times you might hear the pituitary gland be called the control gland. Um, it's, it's really like the hub. Okay. You have your pineal gland, your thyroid gland, adrenal gland, reproductive glands, and then your pancreas. All of those are going to release specifics based on what type of hormone will come out of each one of those regions. Okay, but you can see where they're located on the right. And, you know, that that's going to be where once you find where they're located, then you know where they have to travel if they're trying to get to certain regions. So one of the things that we want to pay attention to, though, um, and, and a little bit more, uh, we'll get into more specifics of each one of these. But really, the first thing that comes to our hormonal side of everything here, you know, is insulin and glucagon and how that can, you know, really has a massive control on your blood glucose level. So again, this is something that, you know, diabetics have a really hard time, you know, with their control of. So when we look at this here, insulin is secreted by, it's secreted and released by, you know, the, the pancreas, okay? And so what it does at that point is it will transport glucose in particular to muscle liver, the muscle, the liver, or fat cells, okay? And at that point, when insulin's released, what it's doing is it's taking glucose out of the bloodstream and putting it into those areas which will lower blood glucose levels, okay? So 
at that point, what you do is you have an uptake of glucose, which is converted into what we call glycogen or stored glucose within the muscle, the liver, and the fat cells. So insulin doesn't have a mechanism that differentiates between where it stores things. So it, it's wherever it can put it. So if you have an overabundance of carbohydrates in your system and your muscles and your liver can't accept anymore, then that, that carbohydrate will, you know, the glucose will get sent to adipose tissue where it'll be uptake, it'll have an uptake and it'll end up getting sit, sent there to be stored as a fat cell. So it can be, you know, that can be a problem you know, especially if you're sedentary and don't work out and you're diabetic, it can, be ca it can cause weight challenges. On the other side of everything, you have what's called glucagon. And this is the other way that we can, can, you know, we can control blood glucose. So when you become hypoglycemic because insulin is more hyperglycemic conditions because we want to lower, hypoglycemic is when you have low blood sugar and what you're going to do is you're going to pull blood glucose from so the pancreas releases glucagon. Glucagon is going to go in search of, um, you know, glucose or glycogen, uh, typically in the liver. And it, you know, if it, the liver is low, then what it'll end up doing is it'll it'll find it in the muscle, and it'll just basically pull glucose into the bloodstream. And at that point, it'll raise blood glucose so you don't feel so low. Okay, and that's really what we want to work for. Typically, though, you know, with glucagon, it'll really go to the liver f before the muscle and because liver will have enough stored glucose or glycogen to extract and then put back into the blood. The, we talked about a couple other ones, too. We talked about the adrenal, you know, pituitary and reproductive hormones that are going to be released from specific glands. Okay, so the adrenal and the pituitary glands are really important for a lot of different factors. So anything from growth to recovery to metabolism, all of that can be coming from these areas. Now, the adrenal glands, which you have labeled there first, they're going to release catecholamines um, and cortisol into our system. Now, we know cortisol as being the stress hormone. We also know catecholamines as being those things that would excite us, um, like epinephrine, norepinephrine, or what we would call adrenaline, okay? And also another catecholamine that, you know, we have is also what we call ACH or acetylcholine. And that's really important for nervous system transactions from the nerves to the motor nerve to the muscle and having ACH released across the border. So the adrenal gland is really important for making sure we have adequate, you know, catecholamines and cortisol. The pituitary gland, which is, you know, you'll find that right kind of below the hypothalamus within the brain. And if we go back to that picture, you know, kind of, you know, there's your hypothalamus. And then right below that, you have that the pituitary gland that hangs off of it. You have your anterior and posterior, uh, posterior lobes that will release different hormones at certain times. Now, typically, uh, we, like we said, it's called the, I call it the control gland, but, you know, the book calls it a master gland. Um, what's their job? That usually it's growth hormone. So, you know, and that helps with development, helps with growth, hence the name, um, you know, that can really help, you know, in terms of, you know, growth from maturation stages like child into adolescence, so on and so forth. Or, you know, again, growth and development if you resistance train and things like that. There's your true adrenal gland. Okay, we talked about epinephrine, norepinephrine on the right side, and that's what, you know, that true adrenaline, that's your fight or flight response. All right, but with the adrenal gland and catecholamines, if it's a, you know, for exercise purposes, we want these to be released because we want to have that spike. Okay, we want to have an increase in heart rate and stroke volume. We want to have higher blood glucose levels. We want to be able to take blood and put it to the working tissues. And we need, you know, open airways. Um, use fat accordingly, you know, and, and break that down the way that we want it to like, like with lipolysis. So this is really important that we release catecholamines at the right time. So typically for our sake, you know, the adrenal medulla, which is the more of the um, outer of the outer ring ring of the uh, adrenal gland, because you have the adrenal cortex. All right. So the actually, excuse me, vice versa. The adrenal medulla is more of that center. The cortex is more of that surrounding piece and will have that release of 
norepinephrine, epinephrine into the blood vessels that run through the gland, and then it'll get sent out to the body, okay? But just an example of how the catecholamines work. Talked about cortisol a little bit. It is a catabolic hormone. It likes to break things down. But the other thing, too, is like it says here, is it likes to serve to maintain energy through what we call gluconeogenesis, or we're making new glucose molecules from things called non-carbohydrate sources. So again, proteins and fats, okay? Um, high levels of cortisol can be detrimental, okay? They can cause you to have a lot of strain on your system, like overtraining, excessive stress, poor sleep, bad nutrition patterns. But understand that in the morning time, you actually do have higher than normal cortisol levels, and that actually can help you with you know burning fat during that time. So if you mess with your sleep, you mess with your cortisol levels, and when you do that, you actually have you may have a little bit more of a challenge with main weight maintenance. Okay, so cortisol is really important for that because it, it really does you know it really does work on breaking down fats and proteins, but you know for what cost if we're if we're constantly stressed. Reproductive-based hormones, testosterone, estrogen, and we talked a little bit about growth hormone before. Um, you know, again, testosterone, you know, 10 times higher in males than females, but again, females do have it, just like estrogen. Females tend to carry around a lot more estrogen than males do, but again, we, you know, both genders have both aspects there. Both genders also have growth hormone as well, okay? So depending upon everything, you know, testosterone is really important for, again, reproductive purposes. It's important for growth and repair. Estrogen really important for, you know, there's, you know, de you know breast development, menstrual cycle regulation. Um, you know, so it, they're really important for those, you know, for gender specific reasons. Okay. And then your thyroid hormones really big on metabolism. Okay, thyroid gland is located in that front part of your neck. Okay, and it releases the, the two main ones that you might, you know, see are T3 and T4. Those are your main thyroid hormones. Now, the other one that is also involved in this whole process is what we would call IGF 1. All right, and IGF 1 is what we would call insulin like growth factor 1. Okay, uh, T3 and T4, again, like I said before. They're really important for, you know, metabolism purposes. We want to make sure that we you know, definitely work with them as much as possible. So we could either be hype. You could also be hypo or hyper have hypo or hyperthyroidism, and, and that can be causing a problem. So T4, thyroxine, and then T3, which we call triad uh, triiodothyronine, is those, those two mechanisms that really help with working on, um, you know, a proper thyroid gland functioning, okay? Um, Insulin-like growth factor, we call that an anabolic hormone, and it is produced by the liver, all right? Um, it does work with growth and development. IGF, uh, IGF-1 actually can work a lot better on growth and development in terms of muscularly a little bit better than growth hormone does because of the function that it has um, like it says with protein synthesis and the fact that it loves to be able to help things get bigger. All right. All, we talked about metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate and your metabolism with the thyroid hormones. So just realize that, you know, that, you know, is a really important piece of that, but also understand too, that, um, you know, with with a lot of other factors here too, you know, you can see here on the bottom it says the hypothalamus and pituitary gland play a role in maintaining normal levels of the thyroid hormone, but also the thyroid hormone can play a part in in, in really releasing what we call calcitonin, which is what's going to help supply the body with calcium needed to keep us with having the appropriate amount of BMD or bone mineral density. Okay, so a lot of interactions from hormones to hormones, and a lot of times we can call that that's called a synergistic effect, just kind of like a like synergistic effect with your muscles. All right. But understand that, you know, long training can affect hor hormonal levels, but understand too, that if you don't recover and, and, and again, have an adequate amount of sleep, it really can mess with 
your your hormonal balance and really mess with how well you can perform on a day-to-day basis. Now, by perform, I mean just do everyday functioning. You know, that could be anything from going to work to working out to, you know, uh, going and babysitting a, you know, a, a, your friend's kid. You know, all those things really make a difference. So what are we saying? Six or more hours of sleep can, is really going to make the, make the difference, okay? But again, you can't get 15 hours of sleep on the weekend and say you've made up for that because it doesn't work that way. So moving from, again, cardiorespiratory and the endocrine to the digestive system, we want to just kind of go through the, the, you know, the upper and the upper portion of our digestive system. Then we get into the upper GI and lower GI tracts so that we can kind of understand how we get the delivery of food products to the rest of the body. Okay. And we know that, you know, again, it starts in the head and the neck, which includes the mouth. And then it moves all the way through, you know, and we utilize things like the gallbladder, we utilize the liver, we utilize the pancreas. Um, all of those things will produce specific enzymes to speed up and slow down reactions. We're going to use certain acids that will help us break down food particles so that we can, they can get small enough that they can become absorbed very quickly. Okay. So starting at the head of the neck, we want to talk about, you know, ingestion, you know, taking the food in. We want to then talk about how we go from ingestion to mastication or breaking down the food particles into smaller pieces, all right, so that we can then swallow what we need to swallow to get it down into the next part, which would be your um, upper GI tract. So if that food isn't broken down small enough, we know we can you know, choke or anything like that. So the upper, what we talk about there is once we swallow food, we don't want it to go down the trachea, we want it to go down the esophagus. Once it goes to the esophagus, it'll empty into the stomach. That stomach has a bunch of what we would call gastric juices. And what it does, it kind of like is marinating all that food and helping break it down. Okay. At that point, what we end up with is a, like a hodgepodge of solid slash liquid called chyme or, you know, C-H-Y-M-E chyme. Okay. And what that does is it allows food to get from, you know, not just a solid and not just a liquid, but into a kind of like, you know, semi-fluid form. And it'll go into the, um, the small intestines where then we want to work on breaking down the food a little bit more. All right. And working on, um, you know, basically starting the absorption process to get this food, these food particles to the rest of the body. Now you have your, you know, the, the introductory component to that is your duodenum, right? The duodenum will empty out into the the secondary component, which we would call your jejunum. And then you also would end up moving that through your ileum. Okay. So that is where, again, we work on absorption of, of our, of our macronutrients. So carbs, fats, and proteins. We're also going to absorb calcium. We're going to absorb iron and all of those happen in the duodenum and the jejunum. And then the ileum will take in things like your, your minerals, your salts, and then your, your vitamins, your water, all right, all of those will get put in through there. So different points will take in different things. So really kind of cool how you differentiate and the small intestine just doesn't work as one solid unit. They work on different bits and pieces. Hmm. I'm having trouble hearing. So, and of course, Siri wants to talk to us at the same time. So as we move everything from the ileum, we were then, we're then going to then release everything into our lower GI tract or our large intestine. So at that point, it becomes a little bit more challenging here because there's little to no digestion that happens at this point. There is no, you know, really there's minimal absorption, minimal digestion, okay? Because eventually we want to move through all of our components of the, you know, the colon pieces through the rectum, you know, through the, you know, and then eventually out through the anus. And that really becomes, a, you know, it could become a challenge if we're not hydrated, if we haven't, if, if the small intestines didn't break down things small enough. So it really can become a much of a struggle. Okay. So, you know, again, what do we, we're really, really concerned about is, you know, that, like it says here, we want to, you know, with physical activity, we want to be able to improve intestinal mobility, making things move and avoid and stave off constipation because that can be a problem as well. No one wants that. So peristalsis, you know, or if we go back, 
looking at truly what where were we at with peristalsis where just so we can kind of go back into our you know where you can find that term it is hmm well basically you know again peristalsis being you know the the breakdown of, of all of your food all right and and basically you know working on you know it being enhanced by the um by your physical activity can really help with you know making sure that that happens but again without that um constriction and relaxation of the intestines you know you're it's it, you know you're going to have you know um a lack of motion of everything so it's really important that we work on that for that absorption digestion piece so um, if you notice here, though, there's a couple of studies that were done, which is really kind of cool to see too, that, you know, with resistance train or with just resistance and cardio training that the colon just worked a lot better. It's, it was able to take transit time, um, meaning that you're going to get rid of your waste byproducts a little bit quicker. And so it's not sitting in your system for as long, which could eventually lead to constipation. And there was another one, um, you know, where, you know, you really want to, you know, they did an aerobic study on that and it really showed that resistance training was one of those things that really helped with the movement piece of everything. So, you know, um, what we're saying here, aerobic resistance training can help with the digestive efficiency and then help your GI system as much as possible. So again, this is chapter six, cardiorespiratory, endocrine and digestive systems. And putting them all together to understand, like, you know, again, is there an effect with exercise? How do hormones work? How does the, you know, the GI system really help with the digestive system really move everything through? Where does the digestion and absorption take place? So it's very, very critical to kind of, you know, pull those things apart and dissect them. So, again, chapter six, another great set of systems chapter. And then after this, we'll move into chapter seven um, and be, you know, be a little bit more active um with other components such as and i'm just trying to pull that just i want to make sure that we have the right information here um you will be getting into chapter seven working with because i'm looking for the book right now the human movement science so really getting down into the nitty-gritty of a lot of kinesiology based and truly exercise science components okay so be on the lookout for that coming soon all right have a great day